off then. Thank you um, for those who join a little bit later. Um, can always um, tell us a little bit about who they are in the chat um, uh, option on the side. My name is uh, Christina Bache. I'm the chair of our working group on business for peace. And I'm uh, also an associate researcher at the Brussels School of Governance here in Brussels. Um, the run of the, the show for today is that I will briefly tell you a little bit about our um, working group and then hand the virtual microphone over to uh, Yi Huang, who is our uh, coordinator from the Principles for Responsible Management Education. And then we'll turn it over to our guest speaker um, of the day, Renahan Gill, who I'm very happy uh, he could join us. Uh, Renahan is one of our core members. And so it's so nice that he can actually uh, like take center stage and share his work with us. And we'll have a bit of time uh, left over, hopefully, for Q&A before wrapping up uh, the call uh, today. So if I could um, maybe just tell you a little bit about our working group, um, not to, to take too much time. Our working group was uh, founded by two academics, um, uh, Professor uh, Robert McNulty, who was at Bentley College at the time, and John Katsos, who is still at American University of Sharjah. And they launched the working group in 2014 to uh, create a space that would um, promote a discussion around the role of business or the private sector um, in enhancing the conditions that we often um, determine that often determine whether or not instability, uh, fragility will evolve into a durable peace, a multi-dimensional understanding of peace, uh, where we look at both the absence of um, physical and direct violence, as well as an absence of um, structural violence. And, um, or whether or not the, those um, conditions lead to an uptick in uh, violence uh, and even armed conflict. And the main impetus behind this was um, trying to influence uh, and encourage business and management schools uh, to take stock of that, of those different approaches and incorporate those approaches into their curriculum. So that's us at a, in a nutshell. And I'm also happy to say that um, the leader, we will be experiencing a leadership transition in the near future. Um, I've been um, chairing the working group, have had the privilege of chairing the working group for the last four years. Um, and I'm very happy to say that we will have a new generation of leadership um, where uh, Jason Miklian, who is another core member um, of our working group, will assume the chair uh, toward the end of the summer. So with that, Yi, could I turn it over to you, please? Thank you, Christina. Thank you for the organization and everything. I want to say it has been great working with you and we're looking forward to this webinar and many webinars um, in the future. Um, please um, allow me to quickly share the screen. I want you to quickly, briefly to share with you the history and basic situation about crime. So um, my name is Ye, I'm from Prime Secretariat. PRIME is the short name for the Principles for Responsible Management Education. Um, I want to uh, share the greetings for all the participants for today's webinar. It has been a great pleasure to have you here with us. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about the PRIME. So the initiative was established in 2007 by an international task force of deans, university presidents, and uh, different academic institutions. We are an United Nations sponsored initiative and a, a sister initiative of UN Global Compact, which is the largest cooperate sustainability initiative in the world. Um, this is a comprehensive picture about our reach at Prime Community. So now we have more than 850 signatories. We operate in 99 countries and we are operating in 17 regional chapters. We have 47 champion schools um, this year with us. Last but not least, we have nine working groups. So working groups, they are really enable us to achieve our mission and vision. Um, they are networks that transform responsible management education by focusing on different issue topics in SDGs. We can see all the different prime working groups on this slide. These working groups operate through different initiatives, activities, webinars, like the one we have today. 
um, to bring educators, scholars, and practitioners to the table to discuss different relevant topics. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any suggestions, ideas, concerns, and what collaboration um, proposals. So that's enough for the introduction of Prime. I want to hand the microphone back to Christina and um, our guest speaker for today, Renahan, to share the main contents for our webinar today. Thanks, Yi. Uh, greatly appreciate you providing that um, introduction and overview of Prime, and especially how our working group is situated within Prime. Um, as I mentioned briefly, um, Renahan is one of our um, working group's core members. Um, and so I have been hoping that he would eventually um, present and share his work with us. But I think it's even um, more relevant and more timely that Renahan presents um, to us uh, today, um, being that it is the first webinar of the new year, um, in part because of the, the organization that he is representing, Institute for Economics and Peace, um, is an important um, organization that uh, collects, correlates, synthesizes, and analyzes very um, valuable data, um, data that I even use in uh, my classes. And so I think it's great for Renahan to um, share his work with us and help frame our understanding um, of what it really is that we're trying to measure. What do we mean uh, by peace? What do we mean, mean by security and the role of the private sector in their uh, intersecting in the, on these points? Um, Renahan, um, as you may have seen his bio, um, we shared it in um, the link on the registration page. You'll see that um, Renahan uh, has this aim to help and uh, create a paradigm shift in the way the world thinks about peace. He is a consultant for the public and private sectors. In addition to supporting social and non-governmental organizations, Renahan is a specialist in the development agenda, um, especially the implementation of the sustainable development goals. He's also a consultant in human rights, um, security, and the ESG space. So we have about 15 to 20 minutes for Renahan to present and share his work with us. He has a, um, a set of slides, and then we'll have, um, hopefully we'll have ample time to have a Q&A and discussion uh, session afterwards. So Renahan, if I could turn it over to you. Christina, what an honor. Thank you so much. Um, I want to ask you to be my, my timekeeper please. Uh, there's a bunch of information that I want to share about the main uh, reports that Institute of Economics and Peace launched during the last year uh, to nowadays. So it's a pleasure to be here. Prime is, uh, as well as Global Compact, it's, um, it's an organization, it's a, it's a group of organizations that I have uh, in my heart. I learned too much with the work with um, its planted people. Uh, like this team, I'm meeting now here, all the guys up here, the guys from uh, our working group. Well, it has been an amazing experience. Thank you, uh, especially for you, Christina, for this uh, space. Well, I will share my screen. Um, uh, I will I will deliver to you uh, all the information, and then we will have this space that I'm anxious to, uh, to have this conversation. Christina, I share with you the presentation to share with the group and uh, that will be here, the attendees, but uh, also to the group in our working group, okay? Well, let's see, um, here it is. Uh, well, uh, I'm working uh, today in the field of environment, climate change, yeah, but uh, I'm still representing the Institute of Economics and Peace. Let me just, uh, Pointing here. Okay. That's it. Well, what is uh, the economics and peace? We are a think tank okay, uh, that aggregating data from these uh, around 16 years, uh, fighting with data during the, all this time because digitalization occurs, uh, a lot of adaptation, a lot of um, transparency systems comes up uh, around the world in a bunch of countries. So it was a huge work that uh, our group of economists and um, a group of researchers made to create this environment of uh, this set of reports that measure peace 
the economic impact of violence and then terrorism and then positive feats too. And then we have something that uh, is connected to climate change and, and its impact to the world and the dignity of people. We are around the world. Uh, I respond directly to the New York um, uh, office, but I, 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 but I'm, I have a, a very important partnership with the Mexico City director, Carlo, uh, that is an amazing guy. But we are, uh, have this distribution that gives us an opportunity to understand the world from a whole bunch of perspectives. Uh, we are uh, around the, the Titanic um, environment too, with a lot of research articles, uh, a lot of citation on books, published reports, and we have this uh, the, the, like a securitization uh, aspect to give um, opportunity to look to other uh, points of view to organizations, multilateral organizations like OECD and the or UN agencies too. It's a pleasure to be part of this um, because there's a lot of information that sometimes we can even not imagine, but IEP could, can congregate and deliver to us this paradigm shift uh, on how we, we encounter the, the, the right place to deliver the right support in terms of uh, construct uh, dignity and uh, make a peace building system and models up in a very uh, effective way. Um, in terms of content, uh, I'm, I'm just sorry because I'm still with Ukraine here, but uh, I won't tell about Ukraine right now. But uh, we have data about Ukraine, Christina and all the guys here with us. If you have interest in, I can deliver a special presentation, okay, uh, by mail if you prefer, only with data about and analysis about Ukraine and all all the things that are happening there. I will uh, talk with you about the Global Peace Index. Uh, I, I will use my time um, uh, in a very pragmatic way. Uh, I hope I can deliver good information this time. Well, but uh, it is about 16 years, okay? We rank uh, 163 countries. It's 19.9% uh, of the world's population. It's huge. And it's quite difficult to uh, gather all this data because it's a wide range of uh, heterogeneous uh, environment in terms of how data is generated and consumed in each country around the world. So, well, uh, we created a system that is uh, based on uh, a set of indicators. Uh, all these indicators are pretty well defined and, um, and explained in our report. In the first uh, step of uh, the report, uh, when we define the methodology, all the reports um, are fully available and uh, freely available on, on our websites, both economicsandpeace.org and Vision of Humanity. Um, about the key findings of the Global Peace Index, well, uh, we encounter um, something that is uh, that is sometimes expect, but uh, there are some surprises too. Well, uh, we continue in in a, in a step on the deterioration of the peacefulness around the world, but uh, 90 countries became uh, more peaceful, and uh, and. But 70, uh, 71 countries deteriorated. Okay, it's less than, than the last year, but um, but it's still going down. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, aspects that we need to be aware of in terms of terrorism impact, incarcerating rates. There's a, uh, especially I'm uh, here in Brazil. We have a, a, a huge and uh, challenging incarceration uh, uh, environment here. So it's quite difficult to deal with. Military expenditure are going up, and uh, even um, even at these times, 
when we are looking for a peaceful, uh, peaceful world, uh, it's, it's consuming more and more about uh, of the GDP of the countries. In terms of um, this, this is an improvement, but in terms of deteriorations, refugees is still going up. Uh, it's a problem around the world that we need to deal with uh, in a very um, a harmful and, uh, and a careful way. Uh, political terror scale, I, th I think you all uh, watch around the world uh, as you are, all the things that happen here in Brazil, for example, but we have Chile, we have um, uh, inside Ukraine, Moscow and other countries around the world too, have a lot of movements. Neighboring countries' relations um, are deteriorating. Yes, we have here very, uh, very clear in the South America, but around the world we have a lot of problems uh, with neighboring countries' relations. In terms of key findings of the global peace attacks, Iceland remains the most peaceful country. Afghanistan still the least. Peace lowest things inception of GD, uh, GPI. Okay, peace uh, peace going up uh, three point point two uh, percent, but there's a lot of improvements, important improvements during this period too. Ukraine biggest deterioration, Russia uh, for the least peaceful country. It's it's clear because uh, it's. It's happening uh, a war inside uh, the country, but uh, we are always having uh, a good look into Mina and Africa uh, to make the, the, this that that region not a cool to the, to the rest of the world. Worst for since inception of G, uh, GPI political terror scale, political instability, neighboring country relations they're producing inflation, food prices, supply chain. Issues and economic conditions like the fuel quota uh, deterioration in peace. So there's a bunch of economic aspects and people and structure aspects that uh, that uh, making the world more uh, not too resilient to all all the the movements or the violence uh, kinds of violence that are happening around the world. Well, continuing militarization improved last year. It's uh, something that we need to take care of and be very uh, attention. Underlying measures of resilience, resilience deterioration, corruption, group grievances, factionalized elite, and quality of information uh, is something that we need to take care uh, with a very huge and um, solid structures on the society, not only governments, but private sector too. Violent demonstrations deteriorated. 49% since 2008. It's something that we are uh, looking for in around the world. A lot of kinds of violence uh, groups um, uh, making big movements uh, most part of the time, uh, very uh, in a very violent way. Uh, global impact of violence comes up to uh, 16.5 trillion. It's around 10.9% of the global GDP. It's huge. And uh, it's something that we need to look up very urgently because uh, we are we are not uh, it's, it's lo we are losing control of this. Uh, something that uh, will create a lot of risks around the world. What is devastating the global economy? It's hard to do. Yes, we need to to turn off all these uh, evil ways to to to, to create measures. To interact to the countries, um, neighboring countries, or around the world too. Something that is so important to see in, in our framework is Iceland, New Zealand, Ireland, Denmark going down. It's interesting, but uh, Austria, Portugal, Slovenia. This is the the, the, the top ten countries that we have uh, most peaceful countries still. And the 10 least peaceful countries still always the same. And we need to take care of the people in this country and the governments and all the structures and systems that are well uh, are still there. Afghanistan, it's a difficult environment to take care of. 
but uh, we need to take care of, of, of these people. They are suffering so much. Congo, Syria, Somalia, Somalia have all uh, for so many years uh, civil war inside uh, the countries of Sudan too. Well, in terms of most improved countries, uh, in the last report, we had this. Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Philippines uh, going up in terms of position and measures. The most deteriorated countries, Haiti, continue to go down, even now after some measures that uh, all the world took on in this, in this field. Ukraine, Burkina Faso, and Russia. In terms of trends in peace, it's important to say that since 2008, um, uh, the, the, the peace uh, has declined, as, as I said. So it's important to be aware of because a lot of uh, a lot of assets is coming up to uh, create the, uh, this environment of a uh, of less peaceful world. Oh, just a moment. Thank you. Um, I have a, a guy who comes here and for something. Well, um, continuing uh, with the data, improvements and deteriorations uh, during all this period that we are uh, gathering data uh, is uh, is well stressed in this in this slide. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, endeavors around the world. Uh, to make uh, this scenario change. Uh, it's important to, to keep in mind that uh, a more integrative um, approach is important to make all the all things happening uh, in, a, in a very uh, effective way around the world. Peace, uh, in the last decade, uh, this slide I, I like very much because uh, it is something that, that we can see ongoing conflict is going up uh, every single year. Safety and security is still always almost flat, uh, and militarization uh, is, is falling uh, in, a, in, a, in an opposite way. So uh, sometimes uh, we are not creating frameworks and models that. Uh, could put safety and security in a, in a position that could uh, give us uh, some safeguard to, 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 to keep the militarization and ongoing conflict in a more stable uh, position. Rising inequality in global peace, it's, this is important because uh, it, uh, we, are, we are making a, a huge gap uh, year after year, in terms of less peaceful and more peaceful countries, these inequalities, uh, as you as you know, uh, is a bunch of um, of, um, of aspects, uh, not only social but in terms of infrastructure, transparency, flow of information that we need to take care of, and some groups and countries are not uh, fully interested in give to the population. A safe scenario too, and we need to take care of all this. And changes in the indicators, it's it, it's the most important thing. Uh, we are we are going up in terms of violent demonstration, external conflict, internal conflict, refugees, intensity of internal conflict. This is the points that we need to take care of, uh, but. Uh, uh, but looking to down, we have weapons imports, deaths uh, from external conflicts, incarceration rate, but the violence is going up. And we need to, to, to understand this and to look very carefully and uh, in, a, in a very uh, harmful way to the population to understand. Um, one of the things that 
we be having conversation is we are we are making the right questions to the populations. We are looking uh, really to the, the the real needs of the populations and, uh, and the interaction between populations and countries that we need to have to create more stabilized blocks and the whole world working together. In terms of economic uh, impact uh, of the violence, as I said earlier, um, it's about 16.5 trillion. It's huge. And, and it's going up, not down. And we need to really take care of all the processes that create violence, that create uh, non-democratic space and uh, non-dignity based uh, uh, to the population to create uh, prosperity in the country or around the world. Economic impacts of violence uh, comes up uh, with some aspect like um, uh, its impact the GDP. Uh, the economic impact increased 12%. In 10 countries most affected by violence, average cost 34% of the GDP. In the 10 most peaceful countries, the average economic cost was 3.566%. It's uh, a huge gap, and we need to look at, at this uh, with models and, and solutions that really affect it and have solutions, but we need to have um, access. To call to good and productive conversation about this solution. In NATO countries, need a 2% of GDP. Military sector will rise 7% with all the scenario that we have. Well, this is Global Peace Index. I will pass through um, very rapidly. Uh, Christina, please uh, give me all your support in terms, in terms of time. I will give you uh, an overview of the rest of the. the the, the reports, uh, and then we have space to, to have our conversation. The Global Terrorism Index. Uh, Hi, Renahan. I'm sorry, I think you're muted. Yeah, exactly. Renahan, I think you muted yourself. Oh, oh. Sorry, sorry, okay, sorry. Basically, uh, after you asked me to um, give you a heads up in terms of time, you muted yourself. But I think if you have like 10 to 15 minutes, that would be great because I, I know you have the other reports to go through. So this is very helpful. Are you done? Yeah. Yeah, you're doing great. Thank you. Wow. wow. Let's, let's do it. So, uh, well, so uh, I will have uh, now um, uh, just, just, just uh, three, three reports, just the main overview. As I said, uh, Christina and to the group here uh, will be a pleasure to share more information, more details about, about each report uh, during the year two, uh, if you wish. So about the, the terrorism index, it's a big effort to create a measure to, uh, to understand the impact of terrorism. Uh, we, we, we use um, very largely the base that we have on Global Peace Index, but uh, aggregates some older uh, indicators that are important to understand the impact of terrorism. So the GTI results on the last year uh, was um, not so different uh, from uh, the years um, before, but there's some, th some things that we need to take care of, uh, especially, okay, in Ukraine, um, on the on the west uh, space and um, in the east the space of, of Africa, but especially on, on South America, with all the movements that we are having here, very special movements uh, in terms of uh, impact uh, of violence and terrorism to occurring more here in South America, uh, even in Brazil. So the main highlights of the, the, the last report was deaths from uh, terrorism down 1.2%. Okay, um, the uh, last uh, four years, similar range between um, 7,000 and 7,000 
7,100 and 7,300. Oh, Professor Pangan, thank you. Uh, number of attacks up uh, by 17% uh, to uh, 5,200 uh, uh, and less lethal than 2020. 86 countries improved compared to 19 that deteriorated. Terrorism is becoming more concentrated into conflict zones. 90%, uh, 97% are in attacks and six times deadlier than elsewhere. It's truly important to see that the, the, the way that they are um, making the movement is more violent um, and there are more intelligence. It's not good, but it, we need to take care of and be aware of there is more, more intelligence in these groups too. And, and, and more time uh, financial uh, measures to, to give them um, uh, the opportunity to, to make more, uh, uh, create more risk to the place that when, when, I, when they're acting. So how now um, it's a new epicenter of terrorism. That is up 10 times in 2010. In terms of uh, highlights, it's important to keep uh, our mind um, uh, looking to uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa due to, uh, due to success against Boko Haram uh, with all the movements and, uh, and security uh, movements that uh, the, the countries made up, the uh, deaths decreased by 10%. It's important because uh, there was a lot of violence especially with uh, women in, in that place. That's in Mina continues to decline down 40% to one, uh, 1, 000, uh, around 1,100 people. Islamic State and affiliates in the Stadley group, uh, it's, it's still uh, making a lot of that in, in around 20 countries. It's huge. Uh, and other group is the first growing group uh, and increase, the, the JNIM uh, increased 69%. And other groups uh, are, are working uh, uh, very hardly to take to to, to the, so, some states, uh, some areas. So uh, there are a lot of um, of groups fighting for uh, areas in the, uh, in, the in Africa and in countries. Uh, Fifty-two percent of what has not ascribed to particular terrorism group attacks in the West falling substantially. Uh, uh, 59 attacks, but two uh, very harmful to people that this attack. Uh, politically motivated uh, terrorism overtakes religious terrorism. I think, uh, and here in Brazil, we have a, 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 a lot of uh, expressions of this, five times higher in the last five years. It's interesting because um, the religions are uh, more able or um, aware of the importance to gather and to create spaces of conversation, interreligious conversations. It's a very beautiful and important movement. Mozambique uh, reported the last, uh, the largest drop, 90 deaths down 80 uh, percent, but still a hard place to stay and to live. Well. Uh, very rapidly so, uh, the country is most impacted by terrorism in 2022. Uh, so we have um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia at the top of the list. But Pakistan, uh, Niger and Mali still uh, at the list, as well as Syria and Nigeria. Well, let's, let's uh, begin the conversation about the positive peace in that. Begin with what is positive. Uh, well, uh, academically, uh, positive is um, in comparative way to negative is uh, it, it's expressive. It's, uh, it's very expressive difference because negative is of the absence of violence or, or fear of violence. Well, the Global Peace Index uh, is it has a wide range of indicators that uh, is is based on negative. But the positive peace is added to institutions and the structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. Give us another point of view 
uh, on the in the peace building process based on on development, based on the construction of the unity for the populations, based on uh, well structured uh, institutions and transparency and digitalizations and economic development, giving uh, us prosperity. This is the most important uh, way that, especially I. Uh, saw when when I received uh, for the first time uh, this uh, this concept of positive peace. Defining and measuring positive peace, uh, as I said, was based on the GPI and based on negative peace. Uh, firstly, to create this new way to build this point of view when we have um, where we have the opportunity to look at the peace not only based on on, on the crime. And, uh, and the violence, but um, the development uh, characteristics. And the positive piece um, is, is based on eight pillars. Um, I, I really like to expose uh, for, for everyone, uh, I'm inviting you uh, to look to the reports and read uh, all the details about the pillars because it's, it's so, it's so uh, nice to see how development could work on it. And every pillar has a, a, an interconnection to the SDG, so it's it's easy to make this uh, this concept uh, going uh, tangible uh, on the implementation too with development goals. Uh, it's important to say uh, the Institute for Economic and Peace was the main um, organization that supports uh, the United Nations on the creation of the uh, SDG number sixteen. Well. Well functioning government, equitable distribution of resources, free flow information with digitalization. We have a lot of statistics of free flow information, good relations with neighbors, it's important. high level of human capital, acceptance of the rights of, uh, of others. This uh, creates a new way to create relations to more win win relations, low level of corruption and sound business environment. This is the pillars of the, um, of the positive peace uh, framework. And uh, it's 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 very tangible uh, around the world with our experience that uh, with a good implementation of such thing like this as well as the SDG uh, as a model, also uh, the positive piece is a complementary model to the SDG. Uh, it's in a better uh, better pragmatic way to tell you. Uh, give us high per capita income, resilience, better environment outcomes, higher measures of well-being better performance on SDGs, okay? Uh, the positive peace index, uh, as I said, we use the whole base of the group. So give us a, the opportunity to have this all this bunch of characteristics and impact of violence, but looking to how could we connect the parts uh, in the country to create like as politics to um, conduct a peace, a peace building process to prepare. It's important um, to say that, uh, remember that we gather a lot of data bases uh, in this system survey in, in, this, in this work. This is the map. We have uh, this map too on, on our website. And the most important findings that, uh, that I really love to share is positive peace improve. 2.4%. Uh, Interesting because um, even with all the violence, uh, countries and people are working hard to give peaceful spaces to the populations around the world. We cannot miss the, 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 the portion of violence. It is, it is good, it is positive to see this kind of measure, but uh, we need to connect a lot of solutions to bring this up. Even higher, uh, we, are, we are anxious to, to give the opportunity uh, around the world to put this number higher because what is this positive piece going high, uh, more dignity, more prosperity, we deliver to populations. We measure 126 uh, countries, and improvements were driven by free flow of information, even more digitalization of work uh, happening around the world. This gives us transparency and better uh, better flow of information, good relations with neighbors, and equitable distribution of resources. Even with all the inequality we have, 
there is a, a space that has been building uh, a more equitable distribution of resources system. Deteriorations comes, changes and additives demand low levels of corruption together. Um, Christina, I want to ask you for help. I have just a few slides. Uh, if you tell me that we have time, I just go in more rapidly. Yeah, I think if we could actually start to um, transition to our Q&A. So if maybe if you have just you know, remarks for about um, two minutes, that would be helpful. And then maybe you could elaborate on some of the comments nice. or questions that people have, yeah? Amazing, amazing. I, I, will, I will run with the slides. So people, um, you will have this presentation and um, I'm totally um, here to support you and every single uh, question that you have after our uh, workshop here. So I will, I will uh, go in higher and comes up with this information here. Attitudes, institutions, structures. We need you to, um, to work uh, hard, especially in terms of attitude. I love this slide. It's something that I can um, use because we need to change people and how people think about peace and prosperity and development. I will just show you the ecological flood report. The ecological flood report comes up um, with uh, the Global Peace Index connecting to positive peace and uh, connecting climate change impact in one report. Um, I'm, I participated on the creation of this report. It was really amazing. So um, I will just deliver the key highlights, okay? Uh, I, I just don't want to miss the opportunity to tell about the indicators. Uh, some, some things like food security, water stress, population growth. It's something that we connect uh, on the database that Global Peace Index was built in, uh, to create this report. And the key findings uh, is, well, Countries home uh, to 2 billion people face catastrophic ecological threats. It's huge, okay? And by 2050, some uh, on the, the trends that we are looking for, uh, same uh, 127 countries will have 3.4 billion. So uh, it will grow, grow up uh, very high. Uh, and the ecological highlights is ecological threats, violent and conflicts are closely associated. And this report comes to connect these dots. It's important. Forming vicious cycles of violence. As if your sport working peaceful deteriorates without societal, uh, societal uh, resilience. The world's 40 least peaceful countries will increase their population from 1.3 billion, representing 49% of the world's population. They also have the worst ecological threats. They are suffering from undernourished and uh, will only get worse. This is important. Security, food security is going high. Um, unsecurity. The world's fastest growing mega cities are the least and the less um, capable of managing growth. And this is a very important thing because we have urban situations that are critical. Countries with high societal residents are likely to meet their ecological challenges. It's just um, a few moments. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa facing the biggest challenges. It's important to mention this. I will, I will jump to the next slide, but as I said, we have this uh, important thing. Resilience at risk. I just want to finish this, uh, this point with ecological health. Ecological shock manifest, societal resilience with nice talking ability, lower resilience uh, deg degrades ecology. Well, this is the ecological threat register. I'm inviting you to uh, visit our uh, networks and uh, spaces uh, to download reports and begin a conversation with us. I'm truly open to this conversation. I'm inviting you to meet uh, uh, our book that we uh, launched uh, by the, our CEO, Steve Halilia. It's a very interesting book, met all the thoughts. And well, uh, Christina, um, uh, I, I know I've used properly my time, but thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be here to have this conversation with you.
Yeah, thanks so much, Renhan. And we're really lucky that you are uh, one of our core members so that we are able to get you know, your continuing insight um, when we organize other webinars. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It's a privilege to have had you present your, your professional work also uh, today. I think Kernigan um, and then um, Sastri, pardon if I'm, if I'm pronouncing your name uh, wrong. I think they um, both had questions, comments. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Renahan, for an uh, excellent uh, presentation. And I know you were condensing a great deal more that you could have said, and frankly, that I would have uh, benefited from hearing. And uh, you did actually come up with uh, the definition of negative peace and positive peace after I asked the question about how are you defining peace, which is very helpful. So thank you for that. My follow-up question on that would be speaking specifically about the role of business. I'm wondering if you can um, elaborate for me on how it is um, the various different factors that you are uh, putting together in order to come up with your uh, different indexes. Um, how many of them, or just let's not talk quantity, let's talk quality. How is it that you are specifically zeroing in, if at all, on the role of business in your um, evaluation of peace in a particular area, both uh, how are businesses contributing to peace, how are businesses uh, contributing to deterioration of peace, or otherwise a relationship between peace and business as opposed to peace and government. Thank you, Professor Pengen. Um, yes, uh, it's, it's, um, it's impossible to not link uh, private sector and business to deliver uh, 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 a very solid space for peace, okay? Because uh, the private sector, when build um, economic uh, frameworks and spaces to deliver prosperity, the peace comes up with, with, with a very well uh, implemented system that looking for prosperity and dignity. When we have a space that opens up, open up um, uh, doors, a lot of doors, corruption, to lack of transparency, to um, uh, spaces of work that don't care uh, people well. Um, so uh, the impact is directly on the life of people. And the market could be the best way or the worst way to deliver uh, wealth, prosperity, and dignity. We have a, we have in our website um, a report that connects business with with the data of global peace. I'm inviting you to to look at this. Uh, and Christina, I can send you by email to share uh, with the group too. Uh, it's not so so new, but uh, there we. We reflect about uh, this connection, but for for myself as a as a professional that work with development, without private sector, without a good education that uh, look for uh, a way to create safer spaces and safer uh, economic environment to deliver prosperity and dignity for people and for the whole country or area, we cannot build peace uh, as we expect for our world. And we need to act urgently uh, in this field. Thank I you. I, I, I think if, if there's a report, it sounds like there's a report, maybe a little bit older, but a report that's specifically on that business role. If you can put that in the, in the chat, for example, the URL of that, that's great. Or just tell Christina the title, uh, that sort of thing, and I'll follow up with her. But thank you. Thank you very much, Renan. Much appreciated. Okay. Yeah, Thank and Renahan, I think I'm not sure if you joined um, Kernigan's talk that he gave to our working group in November. Um, he's yeah, he presented on on um, kind of yeah, sparking this discussion or the need to spark a discussion on on whether or not there should be an eleventh peace principle for the UN Global Compact principles. So that's a little bit of the backstory. And Renahan, I have to have a, a, I have a follow up question because I think um, yeah, you'll know that my my work is on the nexus of. Um, the private sector and gender equ equality. So for me, um, also since that I, since I come from the peace and conflict management um, space, 
I um, feel strongly that gender equality should be one of those indicators, right, in terms of how we determine um, uh, what positive peace actually is, um, is all about. So that would be my follow up question. Um, uh, is there any appetite or room or space um, for adding a additional uh, indicator that would focus on gender equality? Yes, it is. I, I, I create a conversation uh, after we, we begin uh, this process to, to make this, this moment run out. And I ask the guys, uh, I want to tell you my point of view. We have the data. We need to disaggregate the data and show up the impact to specific groups. Uh, today, since the, 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 the last, telling you about the last 15 years, uh, Institutes for Economic and Peace work hardly to, to connect and get our data. So uh, sometimes it was difficult to, to have too much data about specific groups from around the world. So uh, now, from now, they told me that uh, with more transparency, more data transparency, uh, it will be a uh, uh, a very soon trend to begin disaggregate, um, disaggregating this data to gender, uh, religious, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, religions and cults and, and other things. Uh, so um, all the, the, the piece without the right conversation, the point is the right conversation uh, and the participation uh, with women, uh, with all the races together, are, are, are incipient. We will continue in the slow pace uh, on the peace building process to, the, to, our, to our Earth. So, Christina, uh, I, I will give you even more substance in terms of what Institutes for Commerce and Peace will, will create, in terms of show up. Uh, how uh, women are impacted by uh, or impact positively in the process. Uh, I will continue with this conversation. Unfortunately, they they don't have uh, gave me uh, more information about how they will do it. But I will tell you from my side, without women participation, uh, this will not happen. A peaceful world. world uh, we will not reach this world as we expect. Thank you for that, Renahan. And, there, and there's a point. Women at business uh, come from the, the, the question uh, of Professor Kangan. The women in business is a very uh, important asset, uh, not, not in, a, in, a, in a simplicity way, uh, but uh, uh, as, as a human being, and so uh, as so uh, is a very important asset to create uh, to accelerate this movement. Uh, it, it, this is another point uh, that I ever talk about because um, this uh, equality of uh, opportunities to show up these principles, way of thinking uh, that the women has. Um, it's important to deliver uh, the unity prosperity because private sector uh, will uh, give us a fast pace to, to this world that we are imagining. Thank you, Venehan. Um, we are uh, like five minutes out from the end of our call. I know the hour goes by very fast. We can go over maybe two minutes. But um, I think we have Sastri and Nabil. Could you please um, share very, very, very short interjection so Renakan has the time to respond? Thanks, Krishna. I'll be short too. Inviting me to the working group, first of all. Many, many thanks. I'm privileged to be part of this uh, great group. And uh, I would like to introduce myself properly. I'm an MBA from Institute of Rural Management, Anand, Gujarat, India. Then I worked with business organizations such as Amul and Tata Consultancy Services. And I'm also associated with charity sector, uh, development sector, associated with uh, FNF uh, South Asia and uh, Frederick Luman Stiftung 
party and uh, i am also associated with fudorius academy and uh, fnf international academy for leadership this is the uh, basic introduction i would like to give great thank you okay, what we hope thank Thank you. We hope you can join us in our future webinars. Nice yeah, that you can come yeah, today. I would be privileged. I would be privileged to join. Thank you so much. Be welcome. Be welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Nabil. Would you like to interject? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's a very interesting subject you are talking about. I am actually coming from um, from Libya, and uh, I think is the main problem I saw in Libya. Uh, is not uh, is the corruption corruption is eating everything eating the bees eating the business eating uh, and and if we don't go out of that corruption uh, situation <clears throat> uh, will be create uh, side problems like uh, religion fundamental like uh, race fundamentals like uh, many other problem coming out libya is a rich country for example but because the corruptions people feel very bad the beast is not available that's what i want to edit corruption is a, one of the key points we should be looking in the future thank you yes point well taken thank you nabil renahan would you like to uh, wrap up do you have any last minute last minute or concluding comments you'd like us to take away we know that everything is important but just a few <laughs> no, no. Uh, this is just a comment about, about, uh, about the, the, the last speech as well, uh, the last presentation as well. Uh, yes, Libya is, is a it's a wonderful country. Um, I hope I can visit. Uh, not only rule of law, but uh, as I said, um, the participation of women and the equitable uh, opportunities to people to deliver good business and good uh, development and professional uh, life is important. And market and private sector should be a very uh, vector, a very good vector to deliver transparency and uh, to, uh, to to put down all the corruption framework that uh, is uh, evilly installed. Well, uh, Christina, I want to thank you. Um, I'm, I'm always open uh, to share, but especially to learn from you, especially. Uh, I know that uh, you know that you are uh, very your work. Uh, from everyone here, I want to um, thank you a lot. It's an honor. It's a very important moment, moment of my life to be here um, sharing this with you and having this conversation. Uh, we need to work hard in terms of create a very, very, very effective and pragmatic um, solution to all these um, hard uh, things that we are looking around the world. We have the solutions in place. We need just to uh, gather good minds and good hard people to adapt and implement. And um, I, I will love to work side by side with you uh, to create a new movement between all the movements that I'm participating. It's a, it's a pleasure. I want to wish you a wonderful day and thank you a lot for this beautiful moment. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining us and Renahan, your positive spirit is contagious really every time you join our calls it's it's really a privilege to have you on and uh, especially to now have have you present professionally, thank you so much. Um, to everybody else also please keep in mind I just shared the link um, to our next um, webinar that's going to be uh, held at the beginning of March we're going to uh, hone in on a specific sector the industries, um, the textiles industries rather. Um, we'll be looking at a uh, American academic um, academics uh, work on fast fashion. So please tune in for that. And if you have any ideas for future webinars, please get in touch with either Yi or myself. Take care. Have a good week. Thank you. Bye, Bye now. Thank you so much, Professor Kanigan.